Okay, so why we're here is because in November, hopefully we'll, we'll be in a position where the people of Melbourne will finally get to make a choice about the big freeway, the East West Link Tunnel. But if we are going to be in that position in November, we're going to have to raise the debate about the alternatives to the freeway and, and to encourage the Labor Party to back them more strongly and to make it clear to the Liberals that um, they've got a, a fight on their hands. And uh, what, rather than talk about the problems with the East West Link tonight, we want to talk about the reasons why we think a public transport solution from Melbourne is both essential and possible. Both of those questions are ones which are quite widely debated. But I think what I want to do tonight is just give you some basic information about the necessity for public transport in Melbourne and why in a city like Melbourne we could still have public transport. There's a lot of people who will just say, no, you can't do it. Culturally, we can't do it because people in Australia, people in Melbourne love their cars too much. Well, simply the argument about that, that is the people of Munich, uh, Munich is a city where BMW is the biggest employer. It's a major part of the culture of German cities. Mercedes-Benz, Daimler, all those uh, this, the car companies are very strong in, in Germany. But in Munich, BMW advertises to the people of Munich, says, a car, you buy a BMW from us, but you, it's not for every day. It's a fantastic ad where the, German, the Bavarian businessman is polishing his car, looks at it lovingly, jumps on his bicycle and rides off to work. And the tagline is BMW, not for every day. So in a city like that, Germans have cars, but they don't think that they're necessary for, for getting around the city. But we move on from culture to some of the other issues. One of the reasons why we need public transport is because if we don't have public transport and we rely entirely on cars, the tendency is to end up with something like downtown Detroit, pictured here, where the red is the surface parking lots, 40% of downtown uh, Detroit. But that's not enough. The orange is the roofed garages. So almost all of downtown Detroit is car park. Melbourne hasn't quite got to that extent, but 30% of the land area of Melbourne is things that we use for cars. Roads, car parks, and the, if we go into the next slide, this is an image which for a long time you had to go to Los Angeles to find an image like this. Right, so somewhere in. Can anybody recognise it? Yeah, yeah. So we now have those sort of images in Melbourne. And if we continue to move towards being car dependent, or continue the car dependence we have today, then these sort of parts of our city, which can't be used for anything else, become much more prevalent. So um, there's a, a reason in terms of how we actually use the space that we have in the city, which means an alternative to car dependence is really important. We go on from there. We also find that if you look at the information from around the world, you find that the amount of money that the region spends, an urban region spends on its transport system, is much lower as a proportion of the total uh, regional budget in cities which focus on public transport rather than cars. So we have more money to spend on other things like health, education, um, other really important parts of the, the social fabric. So if we go down the car dependent road, we end up spending more of our money going from there. And we just, this is a bit intellectual, but um, you folk probably handle that. Um, if you think about how you want to build your city and you want to just make some decisions about whether you're going to go for public transport or roads, the things that you have to understand are not just 
how a tram works and what sort of tram stop to have or what sort of size the road has to be. You have to understand the way transport fits in with the city economy, the city environment, the city housing needs, all the, all the social um, issues in the city. So transport is part of those and shapes those. So it's, if you know where people live, you know how they're going to drive around. But if you know how their transport system is, then you, that also shapes where people are likely to live. And as I said before, it makes an important contribution to the, the economy. And if you, once you've made those sort of understandings, then you can decide how much of your public transport, your system you want to have by public transport, how much you want to have by cars, how much you want to have by uh, pedestrians and walking. And then you start to design your networks. So it, you've got to be making some decisions about where you want to go. So it's not just a matter of saying, let's have the best of both. In fact, you've got to make some decisions about which one you're going to prioritise over the other. And if you look at Melbourne using this modelling tool developed by Jan Scheurer, uh, which is basically designed to look at the public transport system and give an indication of how much access people have to other parts of the city. So if you live in any of those black areas, the possibility of you get move, getting to any other area of the city by public transport to get to a job, to get to your friends, to, to get to school or university, it's, it's almost impossible. Other areas, the green, as it goes up, traffic light sort of colours, as it goes into the darker green, there's more areas of the city where there's good access to other parts of the city. But even in the centre core of Melbourne, where people say, You're, this is just a public transport is just for the inner city, in the inner city they're transport, public transport rich and the outer suburbs they're public transport poor. Actually, very few areas of Melbourne are up in the very good and almost no areas of Melbourne are in the excellent category here. But if you look to the next slide, where we look at Vancouver, measured on the same indices, large areas of the city are in the average and above average category and uh, even there's much more areas along their um, light rail lines where there's where it's up in the excellent area. Uh, yeah. So is that on the same scale in terms of kilometres, et cetera, as the previous Well, the, the whole area of Vancouver is smaller than the area of Melbourne, okay. but the average densities are about the same. And we'll look at the, the question of densities. Their public transport system is much less intense than ours. They have no heavy rail line. Their SkyTrain is basically a, a, a light rail system. And most of the other areas, are, particularly the yellow areas there, are covered by buses. And if we go on to the next slide, one of the things that people say about Vancouver and about public transport generally is that it's to do with density. So it's this sort of housing condition that makes it possible to have the public transport system that in a, in a uh, in the higher level of accessibility. But James, if we go back to the previous slide, those high intensity dwellings are in those areas. Actually, that picture is actually taken from Kitsilano, looking back across to the downtown area, and that's an area of average or below average public transport accessibility. So the density hasn't created public transport in the way that some people think it might. And in fact, if we go forward a few slides, these are the areas of excellent public transport service accessibility. So, and this is the area just across the Fraser River into Surrey where it's average and below average, and, and, but not the, the really poor areas like in, in Melbourne and, um, and other areas so, of, of Vancouver. So the density equivalence isn't there. It isn't because it's high density, therefore it's good public transport. And this question of the relationship between density and public transport is really important because one of the really big arguments that we find in Melbourne is you can't have good public transport because Melbourne is too, uh, too low a density. If we go on from there, this is a graph which 
instead of taking that hyperbola that people will have seen from Newman and Kenworthy's work, which has Houston at one end and Hong Kong at the other, and of course it's easier to have good public transport in somewhere that's as dense as Hong Kong when you compare it to somewhere that's um, low density as Houston. But if you take the sample in the middle of that curve, which is cities in North America and Australia of common sort of density, the relationship between public transport use and density calculated in exactly the same way, you find that the R squared value is only about 0.3. For people who don't use these things all the time, R squared is a how do these two concepts relate to each other? And if you've got a level of 0.3, the relationship is not as strong as, as um, you might have imagined between density and, and uh, public transport use. So if we go on from there, you also find that the density of Melbourne, most of Melbourne, is in this sort of brown category, the 200 to 400 persons per square, 2,000 to 4,000 people per square kilometre. And that's within the category of density which even people like Newman and Kenworthy say public transport ought to be possible. So the density issue is quite complex, but when you look at other places, the relationship isn't there between their density and their public transport use. And if you look at Melbourne, we, even the people who argue that density is important, a lot of Melbourne is at the level of density which public transport ought to be possible. So what's going on? Why is it that some places can have better public transport than others if it's not to do with how closely together that we're living and working? One of the really important concepts in understanding what's the difference is what's called the network effect, which in this picture you can see here's a stand typical bus system where all the routes are separate. If you increase those services by increasing the frequency of those particular lines, then you get more buses on those lines and so it's good for people travelling up and down that line, but it doesn't help them get from there to there. But if you use exactly the same increase in services, and put it in services that mesh, you can get from this point to any other point with only one transfer. That's a, a stylized city, no city is actually like that. But the concept of using the connections between services to get better efficiency out of what you do is what's really behind the successes in public transport around the world. And what the sort of things that they're able to do is you can see this is picture in the middle is probably more like Melbourne. We've got rail systems which operate reasonably frequently, particularly in peak hour. And so people can make journeys, radial journeys, to the city centre. That's encouraged by having parking restrictions. But if you can develop a, a network of frequent services, then you can make it possible for people to make trips which currently they can only do by car and that's for the most, most trips that we have in Melbourne. This, is, this relationship is also demonstrated by these numbers comparing Melbourne with uh, Munich and Zurich. What we've got here is public transport use per head of population. So people make, on average, 116 public transport trips a year. And that means if you make a trip by train and then get on the tram, that counts as two trips. If you look at the same data for Munich, and we're not just talking the centre of Munich, we're talking the functional urban region, which is much larger than the area of the urban region of Melbourne. Twice as many trips. But what's really interesting is the public transport supply that develops. They have a similar system to Melbourne, heavy rail, trams, buses, they have undergrounds, but that's basically trams that run underground. So they run a bit more efficiently than our trams running on busy roads. But it's more or less comparable in terms of the, the type of public transport system. But the service supply, in terms of service kilometres per head of population, is almost identical. But the use of that service supply is very different. So the ratio, the trips per service kilometre 
is um, more almost twice as much. Munich, even higher levels of use. And we're talking the functional urban region of Zurich, so we're talking an area similar to Melbourne with a much smaller population. And even across that spread out population, we're getting much more people uh, using public transport for more trips per head of population and a greater efficiency in, in terms of the use of that system. So it's how the public transport planners put the service supply that they're given onto the urban form that creates the differences in use much more so than, than density. And you can see that in this is the bus and train network in suburban Zurich and you can do it on a map at this scale and you can see that all the buses are there, all the railways are there. You can't draw a map like this for Melbourne's public transport or bus and train system because the, the bus system is much too complicated. In fact, um, this is a real, so I'm not sure if the, this bus route still exists. Does this bus route still exist, Graham? Like, <laughs> it's probably, yeah. But in a similar urban form, similar suburban part of Toronto, the bus route goes in a straight line along the main road. We've got main roads, but the buses tend to deviate off the main roads. So that sort of approach is something that's really important in creating a network. There's this transfer points all the way along here. The buses don't have to contend with slip, ro slip roads for turning, so the bus stops are right near the intersection, so moving from one bus to another doesn't take any much walking, and all of those things are thought about by the transport planners as ways of encouraging people to make the transfer from one service to another. For Melbourne, the PQA and the Auditor General have um, mapped the ratio of the bus route length with the most direct route. And only a very small part has uh, you know, where the Melbourne has with the bus routes are comparable to the direct route. But in, in areas of the outer suburbs, it can be up to twice as far as the direct route or even further. So just to, to sum up, one of the arguments that people will make to you about public transport is you can't have it in Melbourne because we're too, we're too low density. You can see that density isn't a key to the relationship between uh, public transport service and public transport use. What's important is how the network is put in place so that people can have the option of making journeys radially and circumferentially in the city. So if you're thinking about making a trip from one point of Melbourne to another, at the moment, if you're not in a rail corridor, it's almost impossible to see how you might make that trip by public transport. But in cities like Vancouver, in the German and Swiss cities, Austrian cities, many cities in, in Europe, those networks are in place and that's what's important and, and that's where, where the expenditure of money that we put into public transport and we can talk more about how much money we put in but I haven't got time to do that now so I think we leave it there and um, come back to more questions when we see what sort of things are, are burning issues for, for people in the audience so thanks very much. Thanks John. Um, I'd just like to invite Professor Graham Curry to come up now and maybe provide a brief discussion on what you think are some other issues um, that people might think that we have no shot of creating good public transport or perhaps address some of the issues around um, subsidy, cultural issues, things like that. Anything so I have completely unprepared. <laughs> <laughs> I've usually got a, a Ponzi PowerPoint with lots of nice pictures, um, but I was a bit too busy. Um, what to show the agenda? But my guess, my, I'm thinking that what you guys are going to be doing here is sort of advocating a bit for public transport, and this session's part of helping that. Is that right? Right. Okay. Right. 
My guess is you're not a representative section of the population. <laughs> my guess is you're university guys, you're from Melbourne, and my guess is you're living in the middle in a suburbs bit. Um, most Melbourne population people, people, mums and dads, voters, don't get any of all this. They don't get any, they can't understand why people would advocate for public transport, mainly because they haven't got any. Okay, so you saw some great data there. Uh, my own research says 70% of all the service supplied goes to 25% of the population, and a good, uh, there was a study at Melbourne University by Cheel said that broadly 87% of the Melbourne population don't get any service at all. And you know, they're asking the question, what, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna have more public transport, why? You know, they don't get it. So you've gotta kinda address that issue. Uh, I see a real big difference between inner and outer Melbourne, how they perceive it. I mean, you guys have got some. You've actually got light rail, these street cars, and um, you know, other people just don't have that. Uh, which is part of the problem. That's why we've got cars everywhere. Um, so uh, what are we going to do about that? How are you going to persuade those guys? Um, well, for me, the starting point is we couldn't be here. The economy couldn't be here. We didn't have this public transport system. You know, the city centre is actually a big part of the economy. It's actually a big part of Australia's economy. And um, you just couldn't get that many people to Melbourne in the morning with commuters unless you had a railway. Um, to, 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 I think those guys could drive, it's just out of the question. Um, a little anecdote just quite funny uh, to illustrate this. I'm not, not suggesting you tell everybody this, but um, one of the things I did in my career was I helped the Melbourne Grand Prix Corporation, yeah, those guys, I helped them with their transport plan to get uh, the, 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 the spectators to Albert Park, you know? And they came up to me with this great, great idea for cars, you know, promoting cars, that they would hire all of the taxis in Melbourne <laughs> to get their customers <laughs> to the event site. I said, oh, okay. So there was 3,000 taxis then. So if we got a massive occupancy, say three, a taxi, so we'd probably get about 9,000 people to the event site. And I said, um, that's great, you know, that would be in a bit if no one's ever done that before. <laughs> and then I said, have you ever seen 3,000 taxis or 3,000 cars? And actually, th there's nobody in this room has ever seen 3,000 cars. You might have seen Hoddle Street with, you know, several kilometers of traffic down it. And you wouldn't be getting, um, you know, 1,000 cars. It's amazing. Actually, 500 cars just blows your mind, even the Eastern Freeway. We can't actually see that many cars. So firstly, we'll have the biggest traffic jam you've ever seen, but we'll get 9,000 people there, roughly. So then I said, okay, that's great. So how are we gonna get the other 193,000 people there? <laughs> <laughs> you know? uh, it just makes absolute sense. The volumes um, involved, you know, um, Melbourne Metro, big project we're talking about here. It's the equivalent of, of about the same capacity of about five-ish Westgate freeways. Okay. So we're trying to improve the capacity, the business sense, the activity going on in Melbourne CBD, and, and no one's advocating that we build five more Westgate freeways, funny enough. You know, I mean, the one's bad enough. Um, and indeed, you know, we're only advocating building one small road. You know, it's just, it's just not, not even, even anywhere near the CBD. Uh, just the sheer scale of the problem. Um, it is, it's obvious that you need public transport to deal with those sorts of volumes. Um, what are other good reasons? Uh, I think mainly um, a lot of car drivers get that they can get other car drivers off the road with public transport and that therefore they should support public transport so someone else can use it. I'm sorry, it's a bit, uh, a bit negative point, but it really is true. Uh, a lot of car drivers believe that and uh, they're not particularly willing to do it themselves. I mean, I think a lot of families in the outer suburbs uh, really get that they spend their lives with their kids driving them everywhere. You know, you have a taxi at the weekend, and the kids have got no freedom. No freedom, you know, there's a huge disparity between university participation in the outer suburbs and the inner suburbs. The social background and the problems we face 
because of lack of mobility are really a big issue for Melbourne. And I think a lot of the public know this, you know. Um, so um, that probably doesn't help you too much, but I, I do think you've got to recognise you shouldn't be marketing or trying to sell this to guys that are like yourself. Because I think a lot of people in Melbourne already get it. The real, real struggle here is uh, the middle and outer suburbs and the politicians, to be frank, quite frank. Uh, made a mind did a PhD in Adelaide, surveyed all the state politicians around the country, and uh, they are responsible for public transport in Melbourne. And a high majority of them thought that it was financially viable from the fare box revenue. It's nowhere near it is. Um, so they don't really understand it, you know. Um, and um, we have quite a job to try and explain all this. In my opinion, simple messages is what you need. Simple, obvious messages, rather than getting too complex. Uh, people get that other cities are really great. And, and you know, emphasizing the positive. Northern CBD, the inner areas, is pretty good. It's a real sustainability success story. We have so much more activities. When I first came to this city, Northern CBD you could play tennis in the, in, on the main streets at the weekend because there's nobody there. It was a waste ground. Look at it now. It's very active. There's loads of stuff to do. 24 hour city, economically vibrant. You know, tower blocks going up everywhere. Um, a real example of, you know, that sort of European feel. Uh, you know, I, I notice a lot of young people particularly love that inner area, the activities you can do. Uh, so we have had some successes and public transport mode shared the city's growing. We, are, we have got some positives about all that. What we need to do is to you know, get over this barrier, the duality of the inner versus the outer. Um, buses are going to be a big, big part of the future, I think, getting the bus network right. Uh, we're worried about money. We, sh we should always be a bit worried about money with transit. It does cost a lot, uh, but the economic benefits are very high. And bus systems would be a great first step. And we need more of that sort of expansion. But anyway, there's a few things. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Professor Curry. Um, now, I just wanted to maybe open up the floor to some brief questions. Um, if there's anything that people didn't understand, if we move to our um, much anticipated role play session. <laughs> um, so, if there are any questions, particularly with, um, I noticed John left out some of the longer German words he often uses. <laughs> um, but if there are any questions, yes, up the back then. John, mm -hmm. what, what do you think the. Uh, uh, Sorry. What do you think the orbital buses that they put in two years ago now? The one, one goes from California to Florida. Yeah. I would think that's it's a start, but there's a having a route that goes all that way is a, a complicated thing to, to do. They've got to change the drivers that way along, but nobody wants to go. There's only you know, pensioners on a day out, or the occasional journalist doing a story about it. <laughs> on, that's about it. <laughs> but you can you be able to what you now have is data on where these loadings are greater, and so we. we we also need to get them going faster. I mean, in my part of the world, in Coburg, the smart bus goes along Bell Street, but it doesn't go any faster to get you from Coburg Station to Heidelberg Station than the local bus. So these things need to be worked out as larger stop spacing with the local buses providing the intermediate stops. There's a whole lot of things that we can learn from the way other people have done. But the fact that we've started that and it's branded and people recognise it and people are using it. Part of being able to work a bus service is to have some idea that it goes somewhere where you might want to go. People will talk about the bus at the end of their street, but they'll say, well, I don't even do it. You go, where does it go? Well, I've got no idea. <laughs> you know, and because that's because if you get on it, it turns around and goes 90 degrees, 180 degrees from where you first thought you were going, and so you're really confused. So these things are simplifying the system, and they're, they're, but we need to refine them and expand them. Can, can you talk a bit more about the link between um, public transport and the agglomeration, mm -hmm. economic, you know, mm -hmm. arguing about the economy and agglomeration, because that's often the good yeah. Well, that's what, that's what, that's what Graham was talking about, about yeah, the, yeah. the central city yeah. 
and how it couldn't possibly work. Yeah. I'll give you a yeah. very simple yeah. example of this, yeah. all right? Very simple example of this. I used to be a consultant, so I'd be suiting every day, and I would be in the top floor of 101 Collins Street. Do you know who was in the office next to me? Solomon Lou. <laughs> it's the same another. Uh, Richard's man in or something? Well, anyway. So, what's he doing there? Most expensive office, top floor, most expensive place in Australia. Why would he possibly spend all that money to be there? Because he makes so much money because he is there. That's why he's doing it. He's not there for a silly reason. He's there because he's going to make money, right? Well, how can he possibly make money there? You know, spending so all that. It's because he's completely surrounded by businesses that he can you know, leverage off to make his profits. That's why we're in the CBD, okay? It's all that activity that's going in one place. It's, it's completely logical from their commercial point of view. You know, these aren't greenies that are out there to make money. Right, how can they, how does that work? How can they be all in one place at one time? Well, they can't do it by driving there. You know, 200, 300,000 people in the CBD in the morning getting there. You realize how the type of freeway network you'd need to do that? What Melbourne CBD would look like with the car parks? It would be like Detroit, but worse. You know, the reason he makes money there is because there's a whacking great big railway that gets everybody there quickly. It's not perfect, it's old and, you know, falling apart, but that's agglomeration economies. It's getting all that activity together. It's what makes London what it is, uh, New York what it is. You know, uh, uh, I think in a smaller spread out way, Munich's a bit of an example of that. And that's where you start getting the activities. Toronto's a great example, a lot of people love Toronto. It's got great out of CBD centers of density activity with uh, commercial density rather than uh, population, but they do have more uh, apartment, apartment living. So that's why I see this is, this is working. It's about being together as a population, and you know, uh, we're a knowledge economy. You know, we're sitting in the Wacken Gripping University here, and it's, it's all the activity it has with other businesses which help them work together. You know, they're not all trying to live in Alice Springs, it, it's here because of the activity, and public transport helps you have that efficiently. But just a little aside, people would have read perhaps this morning that um, the, it's becoming clear that the business case for the East West Link. Freeway is based on wider economic benefits, based on agglomeration economies. Somehow they're saying, let's build a freeway and that will help people work more closely together. <laughs> yeah. I can see why the Infrastructure Australia has said this is completely dodgy. But it's about making it possible, it's mass, the mass of mass transit is, it's possible for large numbers of people to be in the same space and move from there to other spaces. And the only way you can do that is by people sharing vehicles and so, or you know, walking, having good spaces to walk and cycle. So you can't do it with, with car parks. Yes. I have a question uh, maybe for you, Graham. Uh, you know, how would you go about marketing very small projects with large benefits? Um, for example, adding a set of points of meadows or a three kilometre loop up in Murchison East? Yeah, uh, well, um, there's the 80-20 rule. So I did this project for 10 years in Adelaide. We, we evaluated the heck out of every part of the city, all the things you could possibly do. And then at the end, I was able to rank them all, 10 years worth of project evaluations. And the best ones, the ones that were biggest return, but not necessarily very expensive, were in the city, the city, city centre. So and that's why, why? Because you've got so many people. Little things make a benefit. You try and change something like your uh, directness ratio in KC, it ends up costing quite a lot of kilometers of bus routes, you know, 10, 20 kilometers to try and get the directness ratio down. Um, you try and change something in Melbourne City, it is a kilometer here, a little bit more than that, but the volume's fast. So there is a real, uh, a real trade-off there, uh, a, a kind of thing. Um, yeah, there's lots of projects around, maybe uh, signaling, you talk about track, yeah. the railway is mighty unreliable. People really don't realise how, how unreliable the railway is, it's a little hidden secret, um, but there are really substantial disruptions every day, there are 22 substantial disruptions every day, affecting of the order of 3,000 people each, there are 8,600 a year, it's a chaos, chaos railway, it is that 
chaotic. Mm -hmm. It's natural. Sorry? And it means natural. Yes. <laughs> yes. 70% of the network, they don't even know what's there. Dark territories, you obviously have experienced in this. So uh, we've been trying to help them a bit deal with the day-to-day -day chaos. Uh, I mean, a lot of people say, well, it's terrible, aren't they? Because, you know, uh, all this chaos that's going on. I think they're amazing that they can even run a railway <laughs> in such a condition. Um, and I think when we look at how to develop it, I always start from this is where we are. You know, it's far from ideal. I mean, we are saying there's lots of great benefits out of this. Don't, don't forget that. But, you know, we've got to be realistic. It's been heavily underinvested for 100 years. Um, we've just, you know, doubled our ridership. People are hanging out the doors. Really, in time, we need something. Um, you mentioned the mum and dads. Um, and I guess one thing with this one, you know, that will be the argument that, you know, when you're a parent, you've got too many trips to make, it's too complicated to drop the kids at childcare at school, there are after school activities, do all of that. Is there something else that's different about Melbourne, so that, you know, we don't have such a density of um, no, childcare centres or shopping yeah. centres, local facilities that just rule it out for other reasons as well? Or what is a good argument to kind of counter that? Like, I have a feeling on that, like, so I am a parent and yeah. I have a car, so... Well, partly, partly I mean, I've had this discussion with a lot of parents, and a lot of it is about fear of letting people use, their children use the public transport system as it is, so you, you need to get a critical mass of people onto the system outside peak hour so that it feels safe. But interesting, I was, a few years ago I was in Zurich and I was staying with a guy who was a teaching English at the local high school and the singing for my supper I went to talk to his class though Australia was their topic for the year so why was I in, in Missouri in the public transport system and I said what are you here for? It's crap. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know the public transport system here in Missouri? Yeah it's terrible there's, there's a night train at two o'clock and a night train at four o'clock and you can't you know two o'clock's too early to come home and four o'clock's too late. <laughs> so I said well let's just take a deep breath just imagine you lived in the city, which is the case in Melbourne at the time, where east of Warrigal Road, the last bus ran at 6 o'clock on Saturday and didn't start again until 8 o'clock on Monday morning. And they started hanging a bit. But then I'd have to, but my parents would have to, and then I'd be, and they just couldn't imagine their lives without public transport and the, you know, the freedom that they had to be around and parents had no fuss about their kids being out on the street <coughs> yeah. and in public transport that's just normal so it's a part of a process of once you get the public transport to a level where people start to be able to use it and you start to change the shift of you know the demographic mix of who's there and it becomes safer and parents are able to do it. and that's that's part of the this is, it's not as if it's always been like that in, in the European cities. They've gone from very poor to, to better over the last 20 or 30 years. So it's, it's about creating a system that allows that to happen. But then you're right too about how, if, you're, if you look at somebody's, where they live and where the childcare is and where the shop is and where the doctor is, it's a diff trip in a different direction. So we have to be better at clustering destinations so that they can all be served by a fewer number of public transport trips. Um, can you remember? I don't know how old the kids are now, but when they're toddlers, do you remember what it's like on the street? So you're going to go down the street and go shopping. What does it feel like as a, as a mom? You've got the kids there. You're spending your, all, all your time worried about where they are. You've got a hold of them, you're worried they're going to run off because sometimes they do that. It's like your whole life is encapsulated in this, keep a control of them because you're worried they're going to go somewhere and they're going to get hurt. And what it's all about is about the traffic. It's about the traffic. It's what you're worried about. So I have taken my son, daughter, and my toddlers to some of these people like uh, Strasbourg, these cities where it's completely pedestrianized, there's trams. That's all there is. And uh, it was a liberating feeling for us both. They can run around wherever they want. Not 
very good marketing ploy this part of me, but it's it's true, it's how I felt. You know, but the practicalities are, man, you know, mums, middle out of suburbs to get out of the car. No choice. Until, you know, we can get an alternative for that. Question about that, man? Oh uh, yeah. Um, like another criticism, especially like that you read on forums online is like from tradies who say, Well, how am I meant to take my tools on public transport? Oh, yeah, uh, great. You know you're not going to get all that stuff on train, tram, bus. Um, so don't try. But you know, they know what life's like on the road because that's how they live. And they know that the road's full of all these guys who could be doing something else. Traffic congestion really free. Um, we did this great project where we ran transport models of Melbourne. And we, but we took all the, took all the public transport users and we put them back in the, in the cars. <laughs> It was a mighty interesting story, <laughs> you know. Uh, I mean, you know, there's million, there's a million trips, you know, on the transit system. You put those back in cars, you'll soon see what happens to Melbourne. So the tradies, for a start, be that every day now they can do their job because of it. Uh, how how best could they do their jobs if um, if it was better? Um, I've noticed being an inner urban person that in um, school holidays there's far fewer cars on the roads in the morning peak and the cold wheel so in the afternoon peak. And I would contest to claim that um, 30 years ago people weren't driving their kids to school as much as they are now. <coughs> Especially secondary yeah. kids. Let's, yeah. let's take out yeah. primary kids out of the yeah. equation and say, well, yeah, people were walking their kids to school if they lived close enough. But um, what is it? You know, is it the stranger danger? Is it the fact that we've reduced the number of secondary schools? We've aggregated them into fewer schools, fewer bigger schools, so they've got to go further. But it'd be great to see all those cars on the road and all secondary kids getting to school on PT or bike or walking like we did. You know, mm, when, yeah. Well, when, uh, I think traveling into the, town to go to school. It's the, the level of traffic that we have now has created a situation where people feel that the only safe place is in the, in the car, which just adds to the problem. Yes. But, and we have amalgamated schools and made it more difficult. But I think there is some sense, because people's adult experience is so much, I'm going out where the car keys, not I'm going out, will I use my bike, will I walk or So once you're in that mindset, you think that's what the kids need as well and and i think we're in a more more fearful society as well so all of those things but it's making sure that the off-peak public transport system is at a level where and those connections are there you know, that we can make the, the schools work it probably it probably requires some negotiation with the schools because if you make a public transport system work with transfers, then you might have particular times. It'd be better for the schools to start five minutes earlier or five minutes later so that they can fit into a coordinated public transport system. That's what they've done in Zurich. They actually, once they got the public transport network, they said, can, this will work much better for you if your you know, the school starting times match the times of the public transport system. So it's a we need to, ha and that comes from having that initial decision where you say, this city is only going to work into the future if we build it around improving the public transport system. You take what Graham's saying and replicate it across the whole city and say, this place isn't going to function if we continue to have cars growing. So we, once we've made that step, then you can start negotiating between the different parts of the system with it. To, to make the public transport system more successful. Um, yeah, um, the Prime Minister is obviously not a fan of funding public transport, and obviously <laughs> said, you know, don't think road funding has um, national significance. Um, how do you view that when, in terms of you know, the economic benefits to you know, the nation as a whole, and how can you apply influence to try and show the benefits in from the well, You have to keep doing it. I mean, there is a there is a, a very strong 
ideological sentiment that goes back to Madeleine Thatcher, who said, if you're in a car, when, if you're still in public transport when you're 24, you're a loser. So if you haven't been able to get yourself a job where you can afford a car, then you know, why should we do it? And I think Abbott probably sub subscribes to that. You know, if you're not, public transport is the safety net for people who, you know, it's the same as John Hewson said something about if you, you know, the rent, you can tell the renting houses because they're like grasses and cuts and things like that. So that, that sort of demonising of people who can't afford to get out of the public transport you know, is something that we really have to fight against. But I think he's out of step with, I mean, Graham's right that most people are thinking about public transport as something for somebody else. But I think it's really different now from what it was five, ten years ago in terms of people recognising that we are making choices between roads and public transport and we need to start making those more. If you ask anybody, the polls out in the out of suburbs, whether they want more investment in roads or more investment in public transport, they do say they want the investment in public transport. So there's a that shift, and it's giving them the voice to the politicians who don't get it and who don't believe that people are like that. That's the kind of the, the, the big issue that we face. But regularly, there's surveys of asking politicians and senior bureaucrats in transport what level of public support is there for public transport and consistently they underestimate it by huge amounts. And that's what that's the thing that we're we've got going for us is that those people are out there wanting public transport improvements and we just have to turn that into a political voice. Yeah we're gonna screen him you know he's he's too far on that side. Yeah. But there are examples. Now, who's the current mayor of Melbourne? Doyle. 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 Okay. So he was the opposition leader. Extraordinary pro car uh, when, he, when he was in, in office. One, uh, more and more car parks in Melbourne City. He transitioned to Melbourne City Council. Went off to New York City, met, met Giuliani, uh, who's, you know, he's, he's actually uh, a bit right of centre. Uh, <laughs> And Giuliani's talking all about getting rid of the cars in Town Square and how it's affecting the businesses and so forth. Dog comes back to Melbourne, you know, Mr. Sustainable Transport. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, they're not stupid. You see the, well, and particularly politicians. I'm sorry this is true of all sides. Uh, I'm, uh, I try to be a little bit it's hard. Um, and uh, all sides, you know, they don't really care. They ask me. They're really going for the votes. And that, that's how you get them. Uh, Doyle, it's absolutely obvious, isn't it? CBD, its success is being built on all of this. Cars are actually the pro part of the problem in the CBD, you know? Um, so, you know, that's how you get them. Trailers, someone mentioned trailers, car, they're a heck of a problem. But, you know, you, s you start showing that it can actually have a good effect on that business. It will change. Question over there? Yeah, I was just um, looking the other day at some developments in Sydney. There seems to be a, a lot going on there. There's some light rail projects heavy rail bus reorganisation to get some of these simplified lines in place. Um, probably first of all, is that valid um, uh, observation? Is that actually, a, is, is there something going on up there? And secondly, can we learn from that experience and perhaps apply some of the... The other great thing for advocacy is it's a conservative liberal government doing it. Yeah. Well, it's a liberal government. It's not a, it's a, the Minister for Transport is not a conservative. No. She's, she's looked at the problem, she's taken good advice, she's recognised a lot of the things that we're saying and she's working to, to do them. So what's great about that is that it's happening within the Liberal Party. I mean, but she's got people wanting to build freeways that she'd rather they didn't. Fortunately Nick Greiner is you know heading towards corruption scandals so that might help with that. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean it just shows that the politician can open the space for different transport planning ideas to get established and that's what we're really hoping for. I was talking to the Shadow Minister this morning and she's talking a lot with uh, Alana McTernan who did these things in Perth so you know, there's people who in both par parties who want to open that space and there's people who want to keep it closed so you know, our job is to give those people room to move. So I was up there, they've got this great big tour road project called West Connects. Mm -hmm. 
uh, under Parramatta Road, and I was up there talking to them about it because they want to take the opportunity to put some light rail in Parramatta Road. Didn't hear anybody talking about this uh, with East West. You know, I'm sure it's it's a, it's a you know another road project, but uh, at least they're talking about the idea that it could be an integrated project. Um, yeah, I mean, the whole of Sydney, it's, that, that really is a... Sydney's actually us in the future, I reckon. And I'm not trying to say they're more advanced, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they've gone further in the problems that we're going to have than we have. Um, and, you know, Joe Blow Public in Sydney, they get this. I don't think we quite get them here, because they know one of the most beautiful cities in the world has been done over by the cutoff. Not quite a progressive way forward. You know, half of their freeways are now below the ground. It's an awful place to be. Um, I just wanted to touch on the question of um, funding, you know, where the money comes from for big infrastructure projects. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously for a long time, a couple of decades at least, governments have been very reluctant to fund large infrastructure projects themselves through public borrowing. They'd much rather do it through partnerships with private Um, my assumption has always been that that was one of the main things that kept driving why we kept building roads rather than rail or public transport was because private sector or public par private partnerships um, are sort of more easily applied to something like a road that you can put a toll on than something easy like your rate separation or um, you know a lot of the things that would actually make public transport work better. But I guess I'm. On, on a more positive note, I'm wanting to phrase the, the question a bit differently and say, is it actually true? And how do we make public transport projects attractive as a PPP sort of project? Um, because that seems to be the mechanism, that seems to be the only way that we're going to get this stuff funded. And, and sorry, just to clarify, yeah. I'm not, when I'm talking yeah. about private, I'm not talking at all about the whole issue of whether or not trains are run or owned or yeah, whatever yeah, by the private yeah. operator. That's another you whole need a revenue source. We're talking purely about, um, you know, the money seems to, the so way we fund stuff drives a particular model of infrastructure. PPPs and toll roads are, are the best example. You need a revenue source. Yeah. And what's happening is the driver's going to pay. Yeah. And you know, this has been, you know, this has been true in history. Any of you guys, you probably have some planning guys here, wouldn't you, who would know about the Tri-Bridge Authority in New York City and how it created a whole changed the economy of um, and the political economy of New York because all of a sudden there was a revenue source and you could leverage off that for planning. Um, and that's what's happening here. You know. um, some people say there's a, a conspiracy whereby you know, financial sector is looking for money. They're going to make money and there's a, there's a nice easy one. Car-based society needs solutions. Let's tax them. Um, either way, uh, you know, the private sector doesn't do it for free. They've got our money. It's going to be a revenue source. So what about public transport? Well, um, our biggest involvement is either in construction of a big project, where the, state, the government's put in money as subsidy, a guaranteed revenue stream. Um, you can, you have financially viable public transport projects in places like Hong Kong, the um, MTA uh, and the Hong Kong uh, government, when they tender to run services, the private sector come back and says, I'll do it for this much money and I'll pay you. And others say, I'll run it for this much money. And they compete to see how much money they will get. Because they have such great volumes in a small area, it's financially viable. And they, they leverage off the land development value. We ain't got that. We ain't got that. That's why it's, it's holding us back. Melbourne, broadly, $3 billion per annum subsidy just for the city. Yeah. Um, so we ain't going to get private sector involvement in this as a money source. We've got franchisees, but they have a projected forward revenue stream, and they pay the subsidy every year. You hear them being fined for bad performance or given a reward for good performance, but that's like you know at the very edge, and there's this huge group of amount of money that that's being put in with them. So uh, I mean, I, I understand the logic of private sector involvement because you know you have public sectors tend to be not very dynamic, they tend to be very politically influenced over time, whereas the private sector has business acumen, can leverage finance better. Um, so um, yeah, it hasn't. 
hasn't really been, not really helped shown as to go revenue source. What about value capture? Yeah, this is actually the, really the great opportunity. Um, because as I say, you know, uh, there's Solomon Lewis, he's making money out of the railway. He won't agree with it, but he is. Um, it's just, the, the real issue with, with value capture is not that there's a range of options that you can do. There's, there's such a lot of things that you can do, all right? What's amazing about it is it never happens. Uh, I don't know why, I, 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 no one's ever told me. I suspect it's because the development industry who are mainly benefiting out of this, they're just really good at avoiding stuff like that. They're politically clever. Um, and uh, it's hard politically for any of the parties to start you know, putting the word on them to get that to happen. You know, we had a mining tax during a huge, massive boom. How hard was that? Mm. So you see, it's just hard to get those sorts of things up here. It's interesting, though, because the 25% of the city loop was funded by effectively a development nope. contribution. Nope. The Premier of Victoria, I put that very question. I actually met the last Premier, who was an economist, and that was my question. You know, we could do more about this, value capture. And he said, yes, I've looked into that, Graham, he says. He even knew my name. I knew my name that day because someone had told him. Um, and he said, um, he said, yeah, the total amount of capital that was funded from the levy was 1%. Uh, and how much trouble was that? <laughs> so how they're doing it in London, isn't that what's, it's about a quarter, I think, of the cross Crossrail, cross I know that a, about a third of it is agglomeration economies. I don't know if they're getting any value capture back from it. There's, so a, there's a levy on businesses in the city, I think. Mm. In the city of London? Yeah, yeah it's, it's a fix up. Exactly. So it's only 25% of the Or even not. Oh, that yeah. Sorry, I should be clear. It's not, not just the city of London, it's, it's wider London. Yeah. I think there's a, a business size um, threshold. So once you get beyond that threshold, it's that. I've seen two great value captures. The first was done by uh, that great environmentalist, George Bush II. <laughs> he put a tax on fuel. Um, 30 cents, is it, is it the gallon? And that, that goes into a big fund and it goes into all the new start projects. So I work in the States quite a lot and they're, they're building light like railways and bus driver transit systems all over the place. I mean, don't get me wrong there, it's not transit utopia. It's starting from a low base, but they've got loads of projects. And they're funding it from that. Um, so that's, that seems like an easy thing. And we do have huge taxes on our fuel, but it just goes to general revenue. Mm. The other one I've seen is in France, something called Versal Transport. It's, um, it's really great, great democratically. They have an election for a mayor of the town, and as part of the election, you can include whether the mayor or the candidate wants to include a tax on employment for a new transport project. And it's taxed as a percentage on all, um, all, all salaries through, through large employers, and uh, it's one, two percent ish. And from this, they can build a big transport project. And they they have built you know twenty odd new light railways in very small towns, um, and the, the tax continues on, so they get not just the capital, but also the operating costs. So they end up having great transport systems, which get people to work uh, really efficiently. Um, hard to get them politically, obviously, in current economic times. However, you know they did. It funds at least half, about half of all public transport in France is funded by that now. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of the uh, good agencies have some independence about what they do with their money and a, an income stream, which usually comes from hypothecated fuel. We'll probably have one more question because uh, we want to um, finish up soon yeah. at the back then. And the other thing is that you know it's cheaper to have a car and all that sort of stuff. It isn't. Um, so how true is subsidising the car industry? It's not quite as clear as all that. Um, there is something else I'd like to say. When you started off, you used a couple of words. This particular government, I'm wearing that I'm heading for election, um, is saying that they're doing a lot in terms of investing in public transport. I'm not sure where they are. 
Okay, and this is actually your biggest, your biggest issue. They, they talk a lot about the regional railway project, rail project, the biggest rail project in Australia. I'm not aware they did it. You know, they were involved in it really. They, if anything's positive, they kept it going. <laughs> Um, I can't find any new services that put in. Uh, I think there might be two bus routes, one of which is the uh, two kilometre, three kilometre bus route at Monash, where I am. Um, There's 1,200 12, new services to Docklands, depending on how you <laughs> push the paper. <laughs> <laughs> 1,200 a year, 1,200 a week? 1,200 yeah, a day. They've the just turned the line around. Right. Board, I mean, <laughs> public service. Yeah. Okay. I have heard that there's been a, a bit of extra work around Frankston, uh, <laughs> signalling around Frankston, but I can't think why a government would want to invest in Frankston <laughs> more than anywhere else. <laughs> Jeff Shaw, I live in Frankston. That's how he's getting. So, um, <laughs> put a few prisons on the train, on train stations. Yes. <laughs> well, yes, they have, and that's been very Which successful. For themselves. <laughs> very astute, because you know the public like that. So, yeah. you know, they have done something. That, that definitely is something done. But you know, the, the city's growing. Topsy survey it really, really is going through the roof of population. And the services are not are not growing at all. So we're going back to the capital. We are really heading backwards because of our growth. Uh, and we really need to move forward. I think it's just like it's a key message is this you said that we're gonna do a lot of public transport and haven't really done it. So if, if you add up mm. how much a car driver pays in taxes and how much they get in expenditure on roads, they're ahead. And if you think about what the city gets from putting money into public transport, so the language has been co-opted, and there's been people who have thought every cent going to public transport is a wasted cent and ought to be spent on roads. And those people, fortunately, mostly have retired. But that, but that still, that sentiment is really strong. So you have to just really make sure that people confront people on that language and say, well, actually, it's an investment in the city having public transport reaction and all the data about how much less money you pay and, all, and overall, if you go down that way, it's, you know, it's, it's really clear that if, you know, we subsidise the car drivers and we invest in public transport, it's actually the opposite. Thank you very much, John and Graham. Finish off with um, a few points here. Um, aren't you all glad that I didn't make you do the role play exercise? Aww. We can do that at the pub. Um, I just wanted to finish off with um, a few thoughts, a few um, ideas on what the next steps are. Because um, basically, the uh, point of this event was not to have you sit here and talk to and then think, oh, that's nice, and then go home. Uh, but have a think today about how you can use this information, how you can get more information and use it. And obviously one of the ways you can use that is um, with the CrowdSpot tool that Anthony and um, Public Transport or Traffic are launching. Um, there's also other ways you can get involved. Um, definitely one way to get involved is to write to the newspaper uh, on these sorts of issues and a lot of interested people do do that and keep issues and arguments um, in the public knowledge. Because if you're talking about dealing with um, corruption of language, of misleading arguments, then that's one of the best ways to help set that right. Um, if you're comfortable with doing that, you can also you know, spam the Spring Street hashtag or something like that to make sure it's not just all um, you know, snap time staffers. You can write or speak to your local MP, uh, for example. Um, I'd just like to mention the group that um, CrowdSpot is working with, Public Transport Not Traffic, which is a, um, they describe themselves as a community campaign for Melbourne's future. Um, basically, it's a campaign run, I think, partially out of the Public Transport Users Association, if that's right. Um, so they've got a lot of activities that help people um, get involved. I went along to a recent campaign training workshop that was very useful, where we heard about how to put out an effective press release, how to keep your language sort of simple and effective, which I'm probably not doing now, um, how to deal with the media, politicians, and etc. So there are resources out there, and I would urge you to have a look at the Public Transport Not Traffic website, and also their presence on Facebook and um, Twitter. Um, in terms of events that uh, you can come along to, and ways that they can support you advocating for this. 
Um, so if you go to their calendar, you'll see a whole number of events that are coming up that are relevant, such as um, their involvement in the Sustainable Living Festival, um, upcoming campaign traffic, tra traffic? Training, sorry, <laughs> Freudian slip, um, and rallies such as one that's going to be held in uh, Moreland in about a month. Um, I'd just like to also come back and spruik our own group. Um, follow us on Facebook and Twitter so you can stay up to date. Um, come along and um, support the Royal Park Festival and you know today you'll have an opportunity to make a financial contribution if you would like uh, but we are also looking for volunteers on the day which would be very useful so come and have a look at that we've announced the three food vendors that we're going to have and they're all pretty delicious and we're you know going to be announcing the bands pretty soon so we're pretty excited and for those that are students uh, one of the most important things that we ask is that you consider getting involved with us we're currently not an affiliated um, incorporated anything like that group uh, which as someone reminded me today that means if something goes wrong at the festival someone sues me and not the company um, so what we want to do is um, incorporate as a student club which will give us access to more um, financial resources and also mean that the group will keep going once James and I have graduated so if you're at Melbourne or even another university we'd love to talk to you about how you can uh, help us start our group at Melbourne or start a group at another university and keep this going because we think it's a really uh, worthwhile thing to do. Um, I'd like to finish off by uh, making some thanks and acknowledging everyone. Uh, firstly, the people that provided uh, feedback and support on the program, uh, Kate Jones, uh, Penn Summers, uh, my parents who are sitting at the back, uh, Tanya and Peter Shecko, looking very embarrassed now. Um, I've probably forgotten someone. Um, I'd like to give a really big thanks to Justin Cusack from the Melbourne School of Design. That's the faculty here for uh, giving up his evening to film this event so we can make it available to those that didn't come. Um, I'd like to thank all the groups and people that promoted our event. Anthony Eisenberg from CrowdSpot, and lastly, but definitely not leastly, um, John Stone and Graham Curry for coming and talking to us from their uh, vast knowledge and experience. And as a small token of our appreciation, James will now give them some wine. This is the custom. And we will clap our hands.